How can colleges and universities best engage with artificial intelligence? Now, that's a subject we've been talking about for several years now on the Future Trends Forum. This week, we have an unusual session in that we have three guests, all of whom have developed a framework for implementing AI in terms of AI literacy. Now, I, the discussion that follows is pretty interesting because we begin by trying to understand the framework, taking it apart, and we do that. But then we try to connect it to all kinds of other things, other frameworks for pedagogy, other ways of understanding educational technology, and of course, making it work on different campuses. Um, I feel very fortunate that we're able to host three bright young educational technologists. They're all at Barnard College, and we managed to grab them, not only after having done this work, but also as their careers start to take off. So I hope uh, we'll hear from them later on. In the meantime, enjoy this session, and if you have any questions or any comments, please don't be shy by adding them to the comments box below. Enjoy the session. Um, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm so glad to see you here today. We have a whole set of great guests on a great topic. I'm looking forward to our conversation. We've been talking about artificial intelligence and its role in higher education for quite some time now, especially over the past two years since ChatGPT 3.5 came out and everybody's been interested in this. We've had a whole series of conversations covering a wide range of topics, everything from open source AI to its ethics, to what does it mean to be open, to above all, how to use it in teaching and learning. This week's guests have come up with a framework for AI literacy. And we've been talking about AI literacy for quite some time. We have one of the world's experts in this, Brent Andrews with us right now. But this team has come up with a specific framework and they've done so in the context of a small college uh, in New York. So we're really grateful to have them. And let me just bring them up, up on stage one by one. And we'll begin with Dr. Hibbert. Hello, Melanie. Hi, thank you so much for inviting us. Oh, it's good to see you. How are you doing today? I'm well. I am. Um, I'm actually in Vermont, and we did get some snow this morning, so enjoying the winter landscape. It's oh, nice have, in the chat have, where everyone is coming from. So yes, I imagine. Where in Vermont are you? In Norwich. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, we used to live in uh, Ripton, right in the middle of the state. Um, well, I'm glad to see you. Listen, Melanie, I, I, I warned you about my question. We, uh, we ask everybody here to introduce themselves by talking about what they're going to be working on next. So I'm curious, for the next year, what lies ahead for you? What are the topics, what are the projects that are top of mind for you? Yeah, I love this question and so many things. Um, I think one thing that I'm thinking about and writing about, and hopefully my colleagues here will join me in co-authoring, but um, it has been accepted as an abstract, but um, about how we can use Remix, building off of some of the work of Lawrence Lessig, um, and then this idea of multimodal play in teaching and engaging with AI, which is so inherently, I think, invites us to Remix and play and um, have fun with it. So um, that's sort of an ongoing case study that, um, that I'm thinking about and working on. And just sort of in administrative, university role, one thing that we're, that I'm working on quite a bit is enterprise license for different AI tools and which is complicated and I will spare everyone the details of that, but um, you know, that's a big one. Yeah. So. Well, that's a lot of work um, and I'm really glad to hear it and good luck on the, on the publication. And of course, working with the enterprise, we may come back to that. Well, let me, let me, put you on hold just for a second. Let me bring up your colleagues right now, uh, one by one. Uh, and let me move to bring in Alana Altman. Hello, Alana. Hi, thanks for having us. Oh, good to see you. How is everything there? Things are good. Um, it also snowed a little bit in New York today, though just flurries, so nothing, nothing sticking up. Okay, well, the windows behind you look all blue and cold. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you're warm. Well, Ilona, you heard the question I put to your colleague. What are you going to be working on for the next year? Yeah, it's a, such a great question. And I'll be working on, you know, some of those same things as Melanie, um, particularly with those enterprise licenses. But I think as um, 
the year continues, one thing that I've been thinking a lot about is switching um, kind of just my focus in terms of how I talk about AI um, hmm. and how I have how I lead consultations or programming or events around AI on our campus. And so we've spent a lot of time talking about like, what can you create with AI? What can this technology do? But I really want to shift the focus into thinking about, okay, what should it do? Um, and this to me feels like something that is moving up on that for the framework that we um, came up with um, into that like, into those parts about evaluating and analyzing AI and really um, getting past just understanding it, but into using and apply and evaluate and maybe even create levels. And I think this is exciting. Also for me personally, I come from like a user experience and design thinking background sure. and you can bring a lot of that into this approach. So thinking about what are the problems that we have in relation to teaching and learning. And then how can we find solutions to those problems in a more just like broader sense and then look, taking that step of, okay, where does AI fit into this? As opposed to, you know, okay, let's just explore AI broadly. Mm -hmm. I see, that makes all kinds of sense. I, I teach in a design thinking program. So I'm like, yes, yes, this is, this is all true. This is all correct. Um, well, excellent. Uh, that's a great way of rethinking uh, what you'll be doing in the next year. Well, let me bring up your uh, partner in crime, um, Tristan Shipman, and let's see if we can have him join us on stage. Hello, Tristan. Hello. Can Goodness. you hear me okay? Just fine. Just fine. Amazing. And, uh, and are you also uh, on Barnard's campus right now? I am, yes. Looking out at an extremely blustery day. I just tried to go for a walk and made it about halfway down the hill before the wind said, uh, no, you're, you're going to head back. So here we are. <laughs> well, I'm, gl I'm glad you're with us and, uh, and that you're not stranded on a hill. So what are you going to be working on next year, Tristan? What, uh, what are the big projects and ideas that are uppermost for you? Sure. So, I, I mean, hard to not echo the, the sentiments shared by my colleagues. Um, I think we've done a really great job of uh, consolidating and having a really strong focal point for approaching AI at Barnard. Um, something that's really fascinating me going into next year, and I think looking at the framework as well, um, is kind of considering where it came from with Bloom's hierarchy being a lot of the inspiration and thinking about what might we be able to gain from uh, you know, exploring the tremendous amount of research that has been done on that framework. And if there are things that we could leverage and using it in our work, and then, it, you know, are there things that we may gain by departing from it? I think that that hierarchy tends to have a very uh, directional flow where, you know, create is that highest point. Mm -hmm. um, are there ways to mix and match those things? Does one have to achieve everything or are there ways in which we can, especially for programming, like we've done so much great hands-on introduction work with AI literacy, um, but at that you know foundational level, and I'm curious to see, does doing that hands-on work where people are using and applying aid in the understanding, kind of reinforcing that knowledge without necessarily having to go like, you have to know these terms first before you sit down at the computer. Like, mm. can we can we be fluid with that? Mm. That's going to be hard, especially as the technology keeps developing and, in some ways, becoming stranger. Um, yes. Oh, it, it, idiosyncrasies abound. It's it's uh, always a always a race. Oh, this is true. Well, well, I'm I'm really glad that you could join us, Tristan. In fact, here, let me just rearrange the room so um, we, we can all be uh, uh, together. Um, thank you, the three of us, uh, the three of you, for joining us. Um, some of you friends might not be uh, familiar with this, but uh, our, our team has authored a framework on generative AI uh, in higher education. In the bottom left of your screen, you should see a kind of tan colored button that says a framework for AI literacy. Uh, and so you can click on that and that'll take you to the Educause Review article that they've authored about this. Now, what, I, what I'd like to do is ask our guests a few basic introductory questions about that framework and how it works. But then the way the program works is I turn this over to you all. So it'll be time for your questions, your comments, your pushback, your statements of support. 
Uh, so as our guests answer the questions, as you have a chance to take a look at their framework, please think of the question that you'd like to ask. Uh, I, I, I'd like to start with one um, to begin with. Uh, when we talk about AI in higher education, we often talk about it in, as a, in a very narrow way. We think about it as AI in writing. We think about AI in terms of academic honesty or cheating. We think about AI being used in certain other classes, such as computer science or art. But what you've identified instead is a way of thinking about AI literacy across the board. And I, I'm, I'm curious, what are some of the benefits that you see of thinking about AI in that broader sense? Uh, you know, we've had earlier forms of additional literacy in addition to textual literacy. We've had media literacy, information literacy, and digital literacy. What does AI literacy get to add to the mix? Now, there are three of you, so one of you gets to go first. Did you, Melanie, you actually raised your hand. You have to go first now. Oh, my gosh. Maybe I will regret that. Um, yeah, it's quite a, it's a meaty question. Um, I mean, I think... Um, so, and credit to a lot of interest in who were involved in this, we had, we started getting questions from our community in, you know, early 2023 about what is this, or even actually, I guess, the fall before. And um, they had this session called Who's Afraid of ChatGPT? I just love that title because it references a Virginia Woolf novel. Um, or, uh, yeah, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Um, and... From that, there became other things popping up, right, from the Computational Science Center around, you know, what is machine learning to um, questions about, like, how can we incorporate AI in library citation practices? And it sort of became clear that we needed um, a conceptual way to think about where all of these questions could, could fit in and where we could have different types of programming fit in. Um, and so sort of building upon Bloom's taxonomy as a way to conceptually think about how you scaffold, you know, your understanding of, of something that um, is such a technological shift, you know, like it, it became sort of clear, like we need to have some kind of thinking and some kind of strategy around how are we grappling with this really significant shift that is on par, if not greater than the internet. It's going to be really uh, major. So, um, so that's sort of where it, part of like why it, it emerged. Um, I think, you know, to your point about things being, you know, narrow or specific, I mean, I think that obviously is still um, important or like really valuable in, in learning types of literacy. Um, but uh, what was I gonna say, um, losing my train of thought. Um, uh, it'll come back to me in a moment. Um, it's okay. We can circle back to you as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, please go ahead. I yeah. was just going to add to that, um, that I think one reason why we did kind of keep it broader too is um, just knowing that the future of this technology is still very up in the air. And so we don't want to create something that's so narrow that, you know, three years from now, if everyone is using AI agents to do things, um, that's different than just using AI to create um, writing. And, you know, AI video programs were barely in existence in like 2022 or so when we first were talking about this. And now we've got lots of them. And so I think we wanted to make sure that it was adaptable enough to changes in this technology in the future. Uh, I see. I see. That's, that's very, very smart. Um, it's very forward looking. Thank you. Thank you both, Alana and Melanie. Uh, Kristen, did you want to jump in and add anything to that? I mean, I think the one thing I would add is is that, you know, an interdisciplinary approach is in our nature. You know, we sit in the academic technology team, and so we work across departments. Our The, the people that we work with and help, our colleagues, our faculty, like, sure, we may work with certain tools that may, you know, be used more often in one field or another, but ultimately it's our work, our work is naturally broader than that. And I think that the, mm. the flexibility of this framework kind of speaks to how we have, uh, we approach our work and how we've approached, you know, such a large community of intellectuals at our college. Yeah, thank you. I hope it's okay if I, my Please. thought returned. Um, 
always fun when that happens. Um, yeah. Just that the way that I've also seen um, AI education framed in a lot of higher ed spaces is around workforce development, which I think is very important. And I think responding to like really real needs and demands from students themselves, I think it will be really significant. But um, I think sort of having an idea of like we're educating around workforce development and how to use it professionally, you know, I think something is lost in there around sort of thinking more holistically about what it means to use this technology and to learn about it. Understood. Understood. I appreciate that. Well, if, if I understand your uh, your framework correctly, it has four main levels. Uh, the beginning, the base of it is understanding uh, generative AI. And that doesn't necessarily mean the level of, of advanced computer science, but understanding what it is, how it's different from other forms of technology, how it works. Uh, the second level is to actually be able to use this stuff, uh, to apply it, to make things happen. A third is to evaluate the AI, um, both the output as well as the tool itself. And the fourth and the highest level is to create AI. Uh, first of all, how am I doing so far? Have I, have I summed up correctly? Great. Um, and it, it seems like this is, uh, um, this has the flexibility built in where this can go in many, many different directions. But I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you're all at a, at a small college. I mean, you're adjacent to a great world city. You're adjacent, of course, to Columbia University, but you're at a small liberal arts college. How can you do this without a massive computer science program or without a massive educational technology enterprise built in? Uh, is this something which uh, basically anybody can adopt? I, I would say so. Yeah, I, I think that that's part of the beauty of, of the flexibility of it. It's part of, you know, how how we designed it to be adaptable to what people would, you know, where people could find utility in it as a framework, not as a dogmatic set of instructions, not as, you know, a prescription of, you know, exacting checklist items with exacting definitions, mm -hmm. but as something, you know, a guide, a uh, scaffolding that was already said before. Nice. Nice. Well, thank you, Tristan. Um, let me, um, unless Melanie um, or uh, Alana, if you want to jump in on that. The only thing I'll add is that I think also that highest level create AI, I think that's where, you know, you could start getting into those material resource constraints in terms of things like computing power or whatever other resources you need. Um, I think we are helped in that sense by our relationship with Columbia University. Um, but I will also say that I think that section can be interpreted in a very broad way. So we don't necessarily mean like you have to be creating your own large language models. We think of it more as in a lot of cases, like creating in the world of AI. So you could be, you know, a philosopher proposing a new theory about, um, how the world works in relation to AI. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily have to be like something computational or something ah, directly okay. creating a uh, a large language model or another type of model like that. Oh, I see, I see, like creating a GPT or, um, I see, I see. Oh, that's really, thank you. Oh, that's a really good clarification. Well, let, let me stop interrogating you three, um, and let me instead defer to uh, the crowd, uh, all 115 of you. I would love to hear your thoughts and your questions. And remember that you can either use the raise hand button to join us on stage, or you can find the question mark button to type in a question. And we have an example of one of those right now from uh, Kate S. Herzog. Let me just flash this on the screen so you all can see it. Since AI is such a rapidly evolving landscape, should a framework also include focusing on a specific set of tools or keeping up to date with a plethora of types of tools. What do you all think? Yeah, I definitely think in terms of a framework, we would want to be tool agnostic. Um, and that's not to say that you shouldn't know about tools, but when we think of our framework, the goal is to be able to apply it to any tool. Um, currently, like we don't have like 
uh, Melanie said, an enterprise license for one specific tool. So we've had a lot of piloting of different tools going on. And I think that's actually been really great in terms of getting to apply our framework because it lets us see some of these differences and understand how, how this technology is getting applied in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, again, going back to that future is we don't know what tools in the future are there are gonna be. There can be new models, new, um, new tools coming out and uh, things that we haven't seen in all before. So we wanna keep it open and adaptable. That's a good answer. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I'm, I'm curious, Melanie, you're just, if I could quickly build on this, you're thinking about enterprise um, applications or enter enterprise licensing. Um, are you going to be able to maintain some flexibility in that? Or, or, or I mean, are you going to be risking locking mm -hmm. into OpenAI or Google or Microsoft? Yes, that is such a question like that we're thinking about. I think ultimately we want to remain flexible and not um, put all our eggs in one basket, so to speak, and just go with one vendor. Um, the problem is though, is that you get a lot of benefits by locking into an enterprise account with, for example, OpenAI, which Columbia has an enterprise agreement with OpenAI around ChatGPT, because what they can provide is a really um, strict walled garden environment that has really you know, controls around like IP and copyright protections and FERPA protected data, HIPAA protected data. And, um, you know, and I think part of the AI literacy is sort of educating people around these, these ideas of like information security and what does it mean when you're inputting your data that's going to be used to train a model. Uh, but I think like when you're kind of thinking as a whole about getting people to use things or, you know, for example, working with a class where faculty can assume everyone has the same tool you know you do want to have yes. some kind of enterprise agreement um and those usually are at a bigger scale and and get quite expensive um but, you know but there are like so many tools out there so many that are free um you know we have access to like adobe firefly for example with image generation which has been um a lot of fun i have a lot of fun with that so um you know, it's it's kind of just, you know, like everything, there's pros and cons to everything. But, you know, ideally, we have both. We have both an enterprise agreement that mm -hmm. allows for really strict data controls. And we have flexibility to try things on smaller pilot scales or, um, yeah, smaller not, groups. Well, thank you. Uh, and not to dwell on one particular tool for too long, but have you had a look at Amplify yet? Yeah, I know. Well, I, I don't know, Alana, if you want to take that. We we were invited to a webinar, which um, I believe Alana attended. I couldn't make it, but yeah. yeah. We, um, so, so far our uh, look into Amplify has mostly just included uh, me attending a demo, um, but it's definitely something that is on our radar um, and definitely a possibility. I think there are I was impressed with just some of the features that they were able to add to it, um, like being able to edit the text and uh, having artifacts straight in it. Um, I think there's a lot of flexibility built in with it, with being able to choose your model. And um, so I could, it's definitely something that's in our realm of consideration. Thank you. I've had a few people asking me about that. Uh, we have a quick, uh, uh, clarifying comment slash question. And this is from uh, a friend, uh, Meryl, uh, who says that my understanding is then that generative AI platforms are not HIPAA or FERPA compliant, even the enterprise licenses. So, um, so yikes. What I, I, I can respond to that. What I, what I have heard from a VP from Columbia University IT is that the enterprise agreement they have with OpenAI for Columbia is FERPA compliant and HIPAA compliant. And they actually even have like um, HIPAA compliant certificates that faculty can use, I guess, for grant writing or um, for different like funding requirements around data privacy. So, I mean, I don't fully want to speak for CUIT, but um, just, you know, they have shared that it is. Um, yeah, but I, I, I totally understand like, right, there is always going to be, nothing is perfect. There is no perfect system. 
Uh, and just to, just to clarify for folks um, who, who are familiar with the acronyms by uh, IP, Melanie is referring to intellectual property. Uh, FERPA is a United States federal law guaranteeing privacy rights to students. And HIPAA is a United States federal law guaranteeing privacy rights to everybody in the medical system. Um, so uh, uh, this is great. Uh, already we're moving at a, at a high pace with a whole bunch of high octane questions. Uh, we also have another question coming up uh, uh, back to the uh, way that you're thinking of the framework. Um, this is from Molly, uh, Molly Vesich, who asks, is this framework geared towards supporting programs or instructors and or students? I'm going to bet everyone's going to say yes. That's my I was going to say just yes. Yes, okay. and. Like. <laughs> Yes, and I think it can support everyone. Um, the I I think like initially when we were working on it, part of it was just useful to us for thinking about this, but it can be useful to anyone. Um, and like I think we also added in our chat in the or in the links that are attached our AI literacy self-assessment. And this was something I created for our for our workshop we were doing on communicating with your students about AI. And so that was a oh, faculty facing workshop. And the idea was that if you can understand your own level of AI literacy, that can help you reflect on what sort of conversations you're ready to have with students um, and what sort of ways you're ready to bring AI into your classroom. Um, but I could imagine a student wanting to do an AI literacy self-assessment for maybe thinking about, okay, what do I need to learn to join the workforce and use AI? So I think there's lots of applications. Oh, good. Uh, and I wanted to thank uh, Alana for uh, for sharing that. There is a link to that as well in the bottom left corner of your screen. Uh, and that's a really, really handy tool. Um, thank you. Now, th those are examples of Q&A box questions. So uh, you can all ask those. And as I say this, there are now nine questions queued up. So people are obviously not having any problem asking questions, but there are also video questions. And we give an example of that by bringing up our great friend uh, from Armenia, Brent Anders, who is one of the world's experts in uh, AI literacy. So let's bring up Brent and good evening, sir. Hello, hello, welcome. So it's great. Uh, this is, a, uh, of course, a, a, a topic of uh, that I hold dear to my heart because I'm always pushing everyone to develop this AI literacy. So I have a question dealing with your framework as far as the way you structured it. And um, it, Tristan, you actually kind of hit on this at the very beginning because you mentioned Bloom's taxonomy, right? And the thing with Bloom's taxonomy, just like you talked about, is that it's a, it's a, it's a pyramid, right? So you have the thing at top that everybody thinks that that's what it is. Everything is based off of this. So then that leads me to your framework, right? Because you have create AI at the very top. And so that I think might tend to lead as far as like, well, that's the ultimate goal is to be able to, to create an AI, to create that level of stuff. So you mentioned this um, as far as that, that's not really the aspect of it, but I, I, I bring it up not, not as a criticism, but as something that I've run into as well. Um, when I try to get, uh, higher leaders involved with this, I run into them still uh, currently now, when I talk to them about the importance of AI literacy, they're like, oh, AI literacy, you need to go talk to the computer department, to our computer science. They're the ones that should be in charge of all of this. And then I have to push back and say, no, no, not at all. Because the way that I sort of view this, the way that I frame this is that it virtually has nothing to do with computer science, right? And that seems crazy because we're talking about, oh, we're, no, we're talking about computers. Of course it has. No, because for a majority of people, they don't want to be computer scientists, right? They don't want to be involved in that high level of stuff, yet they need maximum AI literacy to understand all those important components of the other aspects of your framework. So how do you deal with that where you run into people that still want to push this as a computer science aspect when in my mind it has virtually nothing to do with that interesting interesting what do you all think what uh, what questions or how would you like to respond to Ben? i i would like to say real quick that i i look forward to a future when i can conceptualize a non-linear framework um because i think so much of of engaging with any kind of framework 
kind of insists a goal. And, right. and it's hard for a goal to not be simply tied to a, a temporally linear future in which you have reached some end point. And I'll be damned if a pyramid doesn't <laughs> do it. You know, it's an arrow. Come on. It, it's it's mm -hmm. built in. Mm -hmm. um, but but to that end, too, I think um, I think at least for us in our in, in my experience, I'll speak for myself, in my experience of working with this framework and talking about it with other people, we are not coming at it from a computer science perspective and the ways in which we're introducing the even the foundational knowledge is is not to uh demand or insist uh that kind of competency it's a competency that's trying to speak to a a much broader uh just understanding you know mm -hmm. a, a familiarity with rather than a mastery of or a completely you know embedded within the field of ai or whatever it is and I, and I think you know alana did a great job of of bringing that to the point of create ai you know it's create in the world of ai just so happens a lot of time the world of ai kind of intersects with the world of us mm -hmm. all over the place in, in unexpected and often ubiquitous ways yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, you know, it's the same thing with like the UN recently released their framework. And a lot of it go, goes nicely with with yours and mine. It's it's, it's very similar with the, the important aspects. But then they also wanted to push this aspect of like, oh, yeah, you need to know about, uh, you know, how computers put this all together. And I'm like, no, you don't like if that's not to me, that would be great to know. But that is like the far levels of AI literacy. I would be very much happy if everyone just knew about the ethical considerations, about appropriate use, about what is academic misconduct with AI. Those are things we're still struggling with, right? So it's like that should be at the forefront. So if, if anything, that would be the, the big push for it. So, yeah, I can appreciate yeah. what you're talking about. Oh, I didn't mean to. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Brent, I, I fully agree um, about what you're saying. and. You know, and I think like one thing that, and I think this is mentioned in the article, but we really emphasize when working with faculty and our community about AI, especially many people who are resistant to it, it's like a, a form of literacy and fluency in something can mean deciding I don't want to use it hmm. um, and making that choice, but making it an informed choice. Um, right. so 100%. It's like, you no, know, the goal, we're not, we don't have an agenda to create everyone to be like machine learning CS programmers, like not at all to be creating their own, yeah, GPTs. It's like, no, we just want to help you understand like, right, what are the ethics of it? What is it? How is it used? And maybe you don't want to use it at all in your class. And that's 100% okay. Yeah. And to add briefly onto that idea of like informed criticism, I think um i've never seen this as necessarily like the goal is to get everyone to level four though i can see why people would think of it that way um and we've actually when we've done some workshops on this we've often told people like we're going to focus mostly on the first two levels because we know not everyone is necessarily going to get into three or four and we'd like to do more with those higher levels right. as people learn but I think something that is important is that if you are going to be AI critical and we've seen, you know, faculty be very AI critical is that you know what you're talking about first. Mm -hmm. So you have some base literacy, you maybe experienced it a little bit. You have a general understanding of what the technology is doing conceptually, even if you don't understand, like, you know, how the algorithms actually work and how a neural network is programmed. Right. Um, so that you can criticize it with some uh, real information. All right. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I look forward to, to that assessment that you were talking about. Great stuff. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And, and you'll notice, by the way, Brent is always uh, the best dressed person on the forum. <laughs> just for him, just for today, I, I, I tried to catch up. I, you know, nice. I do what I could. Um, Great. Friends, we have a whole stack of questions coming up, and uh, and, and there, I want to make sure that we get as to as many of them as possible. And our guests are being very, very uh, polite and um, and bearing up under our pressure very nicely. Um, we have uh, uh, one question here that is uh, coming uh, from uh, our dear friend uh, Roxanne Riskin, 
And she asks this, and I want to make sure that we all get this here. Uh, looks like your renewed type of Bloom's taxonomy model for AI looks highly usable. Have you looked at integrating that with a SAMR model developed in 2010 by education researcher Ruben Puentadura? And I think Ruben is actually on the call here, so uh, we can we might be able to bring him in as well. But what do you think? Have you had a chance to use the SAMR model? How might that work for you? I, I, I'm I'm not familiar with this model. Yeah, I would love to learn more if if Ruben is here and can share a link. Hundred percent. Yeah. To, yeah. It's 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 pretty uh, widely discussed. Uh, simply googling it right now, you'll you'll okay. An, an ocean of an ocean of content. Um, but but thank you for bringing that up, Roxanne. Um, as usual, Roxanne has a really, really good question. We uh, In the chat, we've been having a long-running debate um, about the environmental impact of, uh, of generative AI. And I'm uh, it's, it's way too much to summarize. But the big concern is uh, how big is the environmental footprint? Uh, how big uh, is the carbon footprint and also the water use? And the question then becomes, how does that play a role in an AI literacy framework? Should that appear in the bottom row of how people understand uh, generative AI? Should that appear in level three when you're evaluating AI? Uh, how does that play a role in how we determine uh, which AI to use? So wh what do you all think of that question? We've definitely talked about it in that level three, though I could definitely see an argument for including it lower down and including it in that level one as a fundamental understanding that this takes a lot of computing power and a lot of water to keep it cool. And so it's very resource um, heavy. Uh, so I could certainly see an argument for moving that down and talking about that sooner. That's a good response. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'd say too, it, it kind of naturally fits in with understanding the benefits and limitations. Like power consumption is a limitation. You don't see people running, you know, lo local models tap out on, on, you know, home use computers at a pretty relatively low number of parameters, um, given what we have heard some of these, you know, proprietary models are using. Um, and I also saw, and I, I apologize, I'm, I'm not trying to like poach questions from the chat, but I did see a question <laughs> from, uh, I, I saw a question uh, up uh, a bit ago and it was, uh, I think from Neil uh, asking about faculty who are opposed to, you know, how do you work with faculty who are opposed to working with generative AI and these tools because of the environmental concerns? Yes. Um, I think that confronting the reality of the computational power and the environmental concerns can absolutely be a way of engaging with them. Um, I think oftentimes it's it's easy to think, well, you have to use you know the most advanced model that's out there in order to understand where this technology is right now. And there may be some truth to that. We need to be able to keep up and and very much in the uh, name of this group, we need to look towards the future. But you could absolutely, you know, run a very small parameter model on your own computer and experience what it's like to run a very low parameter model on your computer. And I've run one, the fans turn on immediately. Alana can speak to this. I was in the <laughs> office and all of a sudden my computer started, you know, humming that it was it was running one of these local models. Um, that's no less a reality. Uh, or a, a authentic experience with generative AI than it is to log into ChatGPT and use it. And I think that maybe balancing, you know, the number of ways that one can engage with these. And if part of that is seeing, hey, I'm running a local model and it's spitting mm -hmm. out gibberish and my computer crashed because it can't run it. That is actually using AI. It just so happens that it didn't go very far but that's not like a, that's not a non-productive use of it. That's a very authentic experience. And I can see how that fits into your levels one and two. Um, thank you. We had a quick question, uh, and I think this might be uh, um, for uh, Ilana. Uh, Tracy Yancey wants to know, can we use or repurpose the assessment document? Yeah, that's, I'm fine with that. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. 
thank you. And thank you, uh, Teresa, for the question. Uh, we have another video question, uh, and this is from uh, our friend Jeff Hoyle. Uh, and we just bring him up on stage. Hello, Jeff. Hello. Can you hear okay? I can hear you just fine. All right. First of all, I thank you for this panel and for you doing this these types of discussions. I, I think it's so important. And my question is, I'll try to cram a lot of stuff in a little bit. We, I'm at Central Michigan University, uh, Central Michigan, I don't know, smaller university. Um, and we have a faculty who is on sabbatical right now. He's over in, he's from Norway. So he's over there. He's exploring the, the how do we use AI? So he's of the opinion that it's a positive approach because as in anything, academia is kind of torn, right? Hey, they're going to use it to cheat. And we're kind of on the other end saying, hey, let's figure out how we can empower students to use it. So that's where he's got an initiative. We're trying to get some empirical discussion going on. Now with that, I use AI in a role-playing scenario. I use a Ooh. platform. And my question is, I've used, we've built prompts and it's more uh, linear asking AI to what, what's the right answer? Hey, here's the prompt, what should it be? Should, could or should we use AI as a collaborative partner? Could we share with them, hey, what might you think about? Could it, do you see it as a collaboration rather than a linear? I know you mentioned linear is kind of, hey, we've got this issue, what's a solution? Or could we have a, hey, this, what might we be missing in our approach? Again, what do you think about a collaborator? Good question. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I don't know if, you or anyone in the audience, I'm sure many of you have read Ethan Mollick's book, Co-Intelligence, but um, I think framing AI as co-intelligence is really powerful because exactly it's like, it's not, it's not plagiarism. It's not really thinking, but it's like a thought partner, you know, it's helping iterate. Um, and one of the, one of the ways he suggests using AI is like always having it have a seat at the table, you know? So if you're, in a meeting or even just want to brainstorm things or get feedback on something um using it in that way as like a thought partner um i don't know if that totally answers your question i'll let my colleagues um yeah. also answer but yeah thanks for that answer i mean we're all trying to figure it out right well this is this is true this is true i i definitely think that you know i i see it as collaboration i see it as augmentation I think in our, you know, in the context of our framework, one of the questions in the second level is, you know, why did a why did a prompt generate a particular response? Uh, how can the output be checked for bias and hallucination? So it's in many ways a a response that a any kind of tool gives you only has value because you attribute the value to it. So sure. that that's kind of the critical thinking piece of you know, if you if you need to frame the question in that way of having it suggest things as opposed to giving more directives, absolutely. I, I otherwise it's yeah, augmentative rather than oh, yeah. instructive. Well, th thank you for that. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and Jeff, I'm sure you get the card game question that joke about your name all the time. But do you often get asked if you're related to the British science fiction writer? I get asked all kinds, and as far as I know, I'm not related to anybody of <laughs> okay, importance. Well, but you have, but you have managed to confirm the forum's tradition that any man who appears on stage has to have a beard. So, thank you. Yep. Thank you. And please, please stay warm. I haven't been to CMU for a while. Please take care. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have uh, friends. We're, we're coming close to the end of the hour. I want to make sure that we get as many questions as possible. Uh, and this is one uh, from our dear friend and. Uh, uh, Russian teacher, uh, Donnie Sendelbach, uh, who asked a question, Melanie, this might be for you again about the enterprise issue. Could you speak more about ethical and privacy concerns regarding training third party AI platforms? Yes. Or what are you taking into consideration beyond FERPA and HIPAA? Yeah, great question. Um, so one thing I will say, the, so when OpenAI first had an agreement with Columbia University, 
they were charging um, $60 per user per month. Now that price has come down, but what that cost meant was this was a fully walled garden, fully data protection. None of the information you were feeding it was training their models. And to me, that cost, I mean, you do the math on thousands of people that quickly gets into the millions of dollars. You know, it's not, you know, Columbia has a huge endowment, Barner doesn't, but you know, you do the math on it, it gets very expensive and it's not tenable. But what, that, what to me that signifies is how much the true cost is of what we are giving these tech companies with our data and with our privacy. You know, this is what they are harvesting to build up their models. Mm -hmm. And so I think like that alone can be a moment of instruction around, okay, when you are putting in prompts and you're um, iterating on that prompt, and you don't have the settings, you know, selected like don't use this to train, or you're not use, you're using the free version, not the paid version. Um, there's an ethical question there of like this is something that OpenAI and Microsoft could be profiting from, and maybe some people are fine with that. You know, they want to improve these tools or they don't have ethical concerns, but I think that is um, a huge point of of thought and instruction around like what what are these tech companies um, doing with our data and what are they using. And I don't, um, I, and I don't know if that fully answers the question, but I just, and not to use Tristan's right, I don't want to poach a question, but um, somebody in the chat talks about entitification, pardon my language, but um, I am also like very interested in this term and this idea, and um, and you know, not to get like too philosophical about things, but like, you know, you think about like I don't know if any of you are familiar with Walter Benjamin's work around the aura and artwork that you would see in person in the 30s, and he wrote this essay about like how when you have photography and mass image production, the aura of objects is lesser, and you kind of think about that, and you're like, well, with the advent of um, digital photography and social media, the aura arguably has become even lighter with circulation and the creation of these images and how we consume it. And it's like when you think about AI and you know how you can create images and circulate it in even less time and you're consuming it in less time, it's like this kind of levity and this sort of exponential like lightness of circulation, which I think is interesting. I know this is getting a little like art historical, a little off topic, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I think it relates though to the intensification of like just kind of this, I don't want to say mediocrity, but like, yeah, what is it, what does it mean? And what does it mean when you have especially these companies that it's so, you know, like, can, can AI be a moment to like rethink how we think about the technology and how we use the internet and how we use these platforms? Um, anyway, I'll let my colleagues jump in because I, I, I can, I can ramble about these topics uh, mm -hmm. forever. So yes, I will stop myself. You brought up Volta Benjamin, so I'm I'm absolutely happy. Um, but yes, yeah, Tristan and, and Elena, you can also try and make me happy. No, uh, go ahead, please. I'm not sure if this completely um, ties directly to the question, but something that Melanie um, talked about with the instantification, what it makes me think of is just this, going back to what I said at the beginning about the like, what should you create with AI? And I think one thing I just like to think about um, is that we're responsible for what we create in the world and what we put into it. And so, um, just because we can create lots and lots of stuff with AI doesn't necessarily mean that we should be. And so, um, I like one example of this that keeps coming up is like, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen like Notebook LM, uh, which, but it like can create these podcasts really quickly and it's very cool. Um, but it, I've seen a lot of examples where people give it like the most boring content in the world and then are like, create a podcast about this. And it's like, like things like, here's a policy on our policies and like, here's a podcast about it. And I'm like, who wanted a podcast about your policy on policy? <laughs> like, no one asked for this. And so I think um, that's like a big risk. I think of AI is just creating lots of stuff that no one wants. Uh, so that's something we need to think about going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, speaking of going forward, um, we have um, a whole bunch of questions um, coming in and uh, a lot of comments. And I, I really admire my panelists here for their ability to go through the uh, through the chat. 
Um, we have a, a series of questions. Let me bring up two of them on the screen because they're, they're touching on the same thing. One is from uh, um, our good friend Ben Harwood in uh, upstate New York. And he asks about if AI is taught as a separate literacy, how does that compare to infusing it into existing literacies? Wondering if it depends on the academic discipline or more broadly the general curriculum. So we'll hold that thought for a second because right next to it, we have a question from uh, Xia Bang Yang, uh, which is uh, in the library world, questions about AI literacy is often folded under the broader information literacy umbrella. Is that approach too narrow? Thoughts? You, you see why I combine these? There's questions of you know of AI literacy and how does that bump against the other parts of uh, of the academy? If if you want to take a, a run at that, please. I I mean I I I could say I guess to start that I I think we continue to find that there is no like one size fits all ontology for these things and that's part of that's part of why different literacy frameworks emerge uh it's why different approaches to these things emerge and there as much as i very much believe that our framework is uh kind of has an internal consistency that works you know be as it as a whole there there is an argument to be made with a you know take what you can and leave the rest when it comes to merging it with other frameworks you know they if, if there's a piece that works for an organization or in the context of a library in the context of a discipline it's again not to not to cop out with the flexibility of it but that is kind of an inherent benefit is you can zoom out in as much as you want broaden it bring other things in um, again, if it works that, and if it works is, is completely in the eyes of the beholder of, of who is using it in their, in their academic context. So it's modular and decomposable as well as extendable. Absolutely. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alana, Melanie, no, sorry, Alana, Melanie, would you like to uh, jump in on one of those lines? Or yeah, I agree with everything Tristan said. <laughs> yeah, it was a great answer. Well, that's that's a fair response. Um, we have uh, one question, and I think we can actually end on this question because it's uh, it's from our great friend in uh, Texas, Tom Hames. It's a typically deep question, uh, and I think this will let you wrap together a lot of ideas. Uh, so let me just bring this up. In fact, I'll only put it on the screen for a little longer because it's a really good one. Uh, AI threatens the normative conforming aspects of our educational systems, such as grades, tests, papers, etc. How do you design to support students in an AI world, given these anachronisms? Um, this is a great question that I cannot answer, but um, one thing I've also been thinking about is like, you know, if, if AI what if AI disrupts our ideas of how we think about intelligence and IQ? You know, so like IQ tests, they measure things like pattern recognition and inferences and sort of like different reasoning skills that, you know, if we have these tools that can basically do that for us, like what does intelligence mean? And could we, you know, down the road, like things like social intelligence and emotional intelligence be more valued, you know, and what does that mean for education? You know, because those are things that are maybe harder to measure, but, um, but, you know, I, I think about, yeah, how is AI going to change how we like work with students in the curriculum is, is a major question that I think we're all going to be thinking about. Um, and yeah, I'll, and, and on that note, I'll let my colleagues jump in. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, Alana, uh, Tristan, do you want to uh, try that one? Um, yeah, I guess I would say I'm not convinced yet that those things are going to be completely of the past. So I think I think I'm having trouble sort of coming up with a complete answer to that question. I think, right, like I can imagine in the future that essays will be assisted by AI. Um, I also think you're going to see things, and we have seen this, like people 
you know, doing more proctor testing. And I realize that in the future, again, eventually that's going to shift, but I, I don't know that I think the immediate sh next few years shift is going to be towards like radical new ways of assessment. Um, and so, and I would love to have an opportunity to think more about what that could look like. We have looked at like, what do AI assignments, assignments that include AI look like, uh, yeah. but we can't necessarily, but like things that are totally radical, just I haven't had the time to really get there because I'm supporting more faculty right now. Oh, I really appreciate you saying that, Alana. Um, I mean, and I think this is true of, uh, of most academics who are you know, already up to here with uh, with work uh, services, um, and they keep piling up, especially in the educational technology space. It's very rare to actually pull a task away from you all. Um, that these are, I, I hope in, in meetings like this, um, that we carve out some minutes where we can have that kind of reflection. And I, I hope all of you um, in your work at Barnard are able to help faculty, staff, and students share some of that reflection, at the very least on your first layer. Um, Tom, thank you for the question, but I'm afraid that we're going to have to wrap things up. We are right at the end of the hour. Uh, somehow we've just blasted through an hour with so many questions, so much thinking, so many ideas. Uh, I want to thank all three of you, uh, Melanie and Tristan and Alana, for being great guests uh, and for sharing your insights in, in, into this really, really powerful approach. Uh, what's the best way for people to keep up with you? Uh, is it through uh, your LinkedIn profiles that we shared earlier? Or um, I see nods here, so so that should work. So uh, everybody, if you want to stalk these three wonderful uh, rising uh, educational technologists, now you know how to do it. Um, thank you all uh, for joining us. Uh, I really appreciate this. And I, I, I'm really looking forward to where you go with this next. Thank you so much for having us. This has yeah. been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. This is really the whole really community. Cool. This is amazing. I um, know from all over the world. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Yes, it's a great community. Well, thank you all, and please stay uh, warm and dry in New York. But um, but don't go away yet, friends. Uh, let me just wrap things up by pointing out that we have, uh, if you'd like, we have all kinds of venues for discussing this on social media. So if you'd like to keep talking about this AI literacy framework, you can see um, here are some of my handles on Twitter, LinkedIn, Mastodon, Threads, and Blue Sky. Um, and uh, also, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions on AI, as well as other topics, you can just go to tinyurl.com slash FDF archive. Uh, if you'd like to look ahead to our other sessions, we have some coming up in AI, as well as on higher education's health, student mental health, gaming, education, reforming, grading, World Futures Day, and a community meeting coming up. Just go to our website, forum.futureofeducation.us. I, I want to second uh, our guests' comments. Um, you all are a wonderful group. Thank you so much for the thoughtful questions and the discussion. I hope everybody stays warm and safe and dry if you're in the northern climates. I hope everybody else is doing well. We'll take care, everybody. We'll talk to you online next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>